Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our latest edition of the Weltsmose Wells Tech Talks, an ongoing series of webinars with industry participants uh, on the many evolving topics related to technology in and around wealth management industry. Today we have, I think, from the UK all the way down to uh, Australia participants, so we cover almost half of the globe, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we also focused on the current technology trends shaping the wealth management industry in APEC. My name is Mario Bossi, and I'm working for more than 30, 30 years, yes, oh, that's a long time, in private banking wealth management uh, across three continents, started in good old Switzerland, where all the good things are coming from. Uh, moved 20 years ago to Singapore, where even greater things happening. And in 2013, I moved to Australia, also a wonderful place. Um, while the six months, I think for all of us, uh, was at least to say a very intensive period, there was also something which really surprised me from a professional point of view. All the banks here in Australia and I guess elsewhere as well are behaving like big tankers, right? Hard to move, very slow, and a lot of not yet paperless processes and uh, IT departments that are not the most dynamic part of the business. At least that's my perception. Maybe you have different experience, which is great, but that's what I observed in Australia. Uh, however, when uh, we got hit here in Australia, especially here in New South Wales, about six months ago in March, um very badly with with the covid wave we had to send overnight uh, all our people had to work from home government just shut down in a, in a short period of time all the work and very interestingly all the banks were able to move to 100 percent working from home mode in a matter of weeks something very unthinkable at least to to my knowledge pre-covid and what it confirms me again, if the platform is hot enough, even financial institutions are able to drive big changes much faster. So that was a short introduction of myself, but let me introduce you to our experts today in the panel. And uh, joining me today to talk through the various topics we have are Dominic Gamble, Julian Lenoble, and John Leung. And uh, I ask now each of the participants to introduce themselves shortly and maybe share also one of the biggest positive surprise during the last six months in your professional capacity. So maybe start off with you, John. Hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Welcome, Mosaic. Um, my name is John Leung, Client Director for Asia Pacific for, in, for Delio. We're, uh, Delio was founded in 2014 and, and UK headquartered. We're a leading UK fintech scale-up company, especially in providing white label uh, platform as a service um, model to uh, private wealth industry, it's particularly around private deal, um, private deal flow around, you know, whether it be direct or funds. We have a range of clients uh, from enterprise uh, size right through to multifamily offices and angel networks. Um, so basically anything liquid we can handle in terms of uh, distribution. Uh, some of the clients uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll recognize are some of our large clients are Coots Investment Club, um, ING, Barclays, uh, UK Business Angels, and uh, we recently signed uh, National Australia Bank or NAB um, out of Australia. Um, late last year, we expanded uh, internationally after receiving some uh, initial funding. And we are now offices in Switzerland, uh, Middle East, Australia, and of course myself here in Singapore. Um, some of the positives out of the last six months, um, there's always silver linings, aren't they? Uh, naturally, we've seen a slowdown in appetite, especially in SMEs and uh, mid-market companies, just uh, really, uh, they've probably suffered the most across all industries, not just private wealth. But what is, what is nice to see is that the enterprise level is still pushing for change. Um, I see that with the conversations that we have. There's still progress being made there, and um, I'm very hopeful for that. Uh, that they will, they, that those large companies will lead us out of, of this uh, situation. So that and you know, COVID-19 naturally accelerating digital adoption, digital acceleration um, across across all markets, uh, not just private wealth. So, thank you. 
Thank you very much, John, for your introduction. Um, Dominic. Hello, everybody. Hi, good afternoon from Singapore. My name is Dominic Gamble. I am head of Wealth Dynamics in Asia Pacific. I haven't quite got 30 years to my name like Mario, but I've got about 20 years and probably a few more gray hairs than he has by the looks of it. <laughs> uh, but I, I've been in uh, private banking wealth management for all of my career, about half of it as a private banker, and now the most recent half in the technology side of wealth management. Um, well, Dynamics, we are possibly a scale up. I like that expression that John used. We've been around since 2012. We're most definitely not a startup, uh, but we are technology specialists in client lifecycle management for wealth and asset management industries. So we've been around for a while, headquartered out of the UK. In Asia, our, our HQ is here in, in Singapore. Um, most surprised uh, about well, personally surprised that we're still in this predicament and for a very long time to come, but on a more positive tone, um, from a professional capacity, I'm positively surprised about how we are going to, well, how we're still having lots of uh, positive technology conversations coming through from the financial industry. I guess as Wealth Dynamics, we are fortunate skillfully or luckily that we're in a part of the market client lifecycle management which is really flavor of the month or flavor of the year if you like so we'll probably come on to a bit more about that later but i'm i'm positive that over the coming months and years based on the conversations that we're having if anything covid has been a great thing for our business dare i say it more on that later thanks a lot dominic last but not least julian please Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Lenoble. Uh, I'm Senior Director uh, with Finantix in Asia Pacific. Uh, Finantix uh, is a 20-year-old uh, fintech company, uh, and we digitalize wealth management in, in a very short summary. Uh, we digitalize uh, the front office experience uh, by increasing effectiveness for, for sales and advisors across uh, the advisory life cycle from uh, onboarding and CRM to advisory and, and portfolio management. Uh, and we also digitalize the, the customer experience and, and we'll talk about this quite a bit, I'm sure, throughout the, uh, the hour, uh, empowering both advisors and, and, and clients uh, with data and, and intelligence uh, for intelligent collaboration and, uh, uh, and advisory journeys. Um, my biggest positive, uh, I would say, surprise uh, out of the last six months is having witnessed uh, in real time uh, the saying necessity is the mother of innovation being a, a reality. Uh, and, and that really has encapsulated, uh, been encapsulated into the discussions we've, we've been having uh, for the last six months, really, with, uh, with our clients and, and prospects alike. Uh, it's been quite uh, mind-boggling to see the level of acceleration that uh, discussions around digital collaboration, around intelligent advisory uh, uh, really have, have taken place. And so in a very counterintuitive way, I found myself in, in March, April being extremely busy when I thought that the world was coming to an halt and that I was going to just, you know, twist my my fingers around and and pretty much uh, figure out what could be done. But it was all figured out for me, uh, and and it hasn't stopped since then. So I'll be uh, I'll be excited to share about uh, some of those discussions with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, before we get straight into uh, the the questions so just a little bit uh, that you have an idea on on our journey for the next 50 minutes or so so uh, for about next 40 minutes or so we will in the panel discuss topics around drivers challenges opportunities roadmaps and how the future may look like and uh, after that we will open up for questions so we have a bit of a Q&A and the way you can raise your question, just don't wait until the end. I mean, as, as, as we go through, as you hear statements, as you may, may question arises, please submit them via your, uh, I think there should be somewhere a, a 
chat box. Uh, you can just submit your, your question there and we will uh, pick them up uh, after we, we run through uh, our own kind of little conversation and hopefully answer as many as we can towards the end. Now, let's kick off the proper panel and, and uh, looking at drivers. And uh, there, I'd like to know from Dominic, um, what are the driving forces of change in the Asia Pacific wealth management sector and its technology focus and strategy? I, I don't think much has changed, Mario, over the last <laughs> couple of years, but, but actually in terms of the headlines. So, you know, not a, not a day goes by where we don't read about digital transformation in our wonderful industries. Um, and I think the reality, especially from the three of us on the panel, is that once technology vendors like ourselves get inside of these institutions, the reality is that the digital transformation that perhaps is proclaimed in the media is um, either not happening at all, or the reality is they're trying to make it happen, but it's actually very difficult to make it happen the way they would like for various structural reasons. What's happened, I think, with COVID is that all of the things that um, we have been hearing about that companies like ourselves have been talking about the digitization, as Julian mentioned, of both the client front end experience, but also internally, so critically inside of the, the, the creaky paper driven financial institutions, has had a massive rocket put underneath it with COVID. Um, and things are quite dramatically changing, which certainly speaks for why similar to Julian, we've been incredibly busy and fortunate through this crisis. And it's because clients, number one, cannot meet with their relationship managers. Dare I say it, there may be some confusion on how they can get hold of their relationship managers who are no longer sitting at the desk. And clients of all wealth scales, of course, typically more on the lower end as well, want a digital interface to be able to access some information and do some simple processes, so some simple tasks. And so the acceleration, therefore, of how private banks, wealth management segments are starting to roll out those front end services is really picking up. And, you know, the, on the engagement side, that the, the, the endless conversations around video calls now being one of the preferred mediums are, are just another classic example of how institutions, financial institutions are scrambling and having to scramble to create those capabilities. But I think on the inside of the institutions is where certainly I am the most interested because when you think from everything that we've heard in lots of these industry webinars over the last couple of months that your average private bank in Singapore has a, about 30% of staff turning up to the office these days. Uh, and given what we probably all know about private banking being extremely paper driven that, that old comfort of being able to reach behind your desk and pull out a paper file, walk around the corner to see perhaps the legal and compliance department to chat about an issue on an onboarding case, that's all evaporated. So what you get more than ever to, to our benefit at Wealth Dynamics is this sudden real drive to digitize the way institutions prospect to meet prospects and bring them into the funnel, digitize even more than ever the way they onboard those prospects. And that's not just from a client experience perspective, because perhaps they're not meeting face to face. That's very much on the internal side of the institution as well, the need to have digital workflows to onboard. And, and this isn't, by the way, onboarding necessarily a 30-year-old res dom domestic simple uh, corporate executive, this could be onboarding a multi-layer trust. So to do that through digital capabilities is now becoming more important. And then on the client management side, so we're going through the client life cycle here, how a relationship manager then has the digital tools when he or she is sitting in a hotel lobby, when he or she is sitting in their living room, or dare I say it, on their bed, trying to do their day job, <laughs> they can't go into the office. How they are then doing that and interacting with their device to do it is then even more critical because, as I like to shout about, that you know the relationship managers, whether we, whether we love them or loathe them in in the wealth management industry, and whether we think they're going to be relevant and around, 
in years to come. The reality is they are the sales touch point right now beyond all other touch points, especially in ultra high net worth territory. So empowering these, these uh, he's and she's with the right digital tools for their clients, not just for the prospecting, not just for the onboarding, um, is absolutely critical. I think one other comment I would make is is a more general one that I think that this crisis has got into uh, the minds of the regulators as well in terms of the migration to the cloud. And cloud is a massive topic and is a topic that is 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 frequently voiced but but moves at a snail's pace. Um, I think in jurisdictions where where some of us are sitting today, Singapore and, and probably in the likes of Switzerland as well, the jurisdictions that have been quite slow to meaningfully adopt cloud across the whole wealth management space, I think now that drive and that impetus um, is really there, which is, is interesting news. Um, it's interesting not just because um, you know, for a firm like us who does on-premise and cloud, it might start to adjust that balance. But it's interesting because a lot of the great innovation capabilities that we, again, read about, but don't necessarily get rolled out to the wider client market, all the intelligence, the machine learning, et cetera, that's around buzzwords like next best suggestions, these sorts of capabilities, if the cloud does get adopted in a more um, more widely across the industry, these sorts of capabilities will be more widely rolled out to clients. Um, thanks, Dominic. Do, do you think this whole COVID accelerated, do you think, is it just for the moment and the moment we find a solution or it goes away, uh, we all fall back to the old behavior or you think it's now, it is accelerating change to stay, to sustainable let's say digital kind of uh, engagement is that for me mary yep yeah i, I look I, I do i'm a realist i'm not necessarily a wild optimist around the new normal but i do think that actually these trends are here to stay and you know one of the most what once you start evolving on the digitization process particularly internally as a firm it's very difficult to go back mm. Now, in you know emergency circumstances where, uh, dare I say it, the next crisis is that the internet goes down, then there's always a security measure whether you revert to paper. But the reality is, once you entrench digitized processes, it's very difficult to go back. And and the second point, which I think is even more powerful at the moment, is, you know, out here in Asia, I'm always staggered at a lot of the reports that I read about how digital savvy apparently ultra high net worth clients are, because of course, there are 35-year-old, 40-year-old ultra high net worth clients these days, and I'm sure they're very digital savvy. But the vast majority, in my experience, of private banking clients at a serious wealth level are more senior in age and are not digital savvy. And, you know, I work from hotel lobbies because I like working from hotel lobbies. They're a great place to work in the crisis. And time and time again, I see the same situation with private bankers rocking up and you can spot them from a mile and they've got their presentations up under their arm and enrolled in, I would assume, a wealthy husband, wife, 60s, 70s years old, uh, out here in Singapore, <laughs> most likely a, a local. And they are going finger line by finger line through proposals. There's not a touch of digital. And I dare say it, the clients don't want digital because when I see them on their phones, taking a break, <laughs> glasses are down, and they've got the text on their phone zoomed up to the largest size, WhatsApping their siblings or whoever it may be. So I think um, digitization is maybe not as, not as high at, at some of that ultra high net worth level as we think. But my point is that this crisis has really bucked the trend for everybody across the entire spectrum, whether you're a 21 year old opening a five grand account with a robo advisor, whether a 75 year old switching a private bank for $50 million, it's bucking the trend that people want and almost must have digital touch points and they're using it more and more. And that's, that's here to stay because you don't go back from that. Thanks a lot, Dominic. John, Julian, any additional views on, on the drivers? I think uh, I will, I will add a couple, a couple points actually that, uh, that we've observed in our, in our interactions with uh, with customers and 
and, and, and first coming from you know a, a data point because we did a, an industry study recently that we published and and we found that uh, more than half of banks were making digital high priority so it, it speaks to what Dominic was saying with regards to you know things are happening but actually when you go inside maybe not yet or not enough but there is an intent uh, and uh, the other part of the uh, uh, of the study was highlighting that half of the high net worth individuals, if they were CEO of, of uh, the institutions they bank with, they would prioritize innovation, improvement in services and, and, and client experience. Uh, and so we are seeing uh, a significant shift towards adoption of digital tools or, or plans to adopt digital tools by wealth managers. Now, obviously, uh, with the pandemic uh, on top of this, the trend is only accelerating. Uh, but a key element that I wanted to uh, speak to is the client experience. Uh, and, and this is now seen as, as a critical differentiator uh, to deliver value by, by wealth manager, as opposed to you know, the range of product uh, and, and what really can be offered, which in many respects you know, can be considered as, uh, as commoditized. So there is really a, a paradigm shift for wealth management firms uh, to understand how their customers' expectations are are changing, and and to understand why you know customer experience is uh, has become so critical, uh, we just need to realize that clients today just want you know faster speed of reaction and and information that's instantaneous, real time, uh, and that's relevant to them, and and that's what they want to get. Uh, they also want to communicate. Uh, you know, with a professional at times when it's required uh, because that's what they get from the super apps. Uh, that's what they get in their everyday life. And, and what they get in their everyday life, obviously, you know, remains relevant uh, and applies to, to wealth management. And so as much as, you know, it is an intent today, it is very much a necessity uh, and, and that comes into the discussions we have with our, with our clients and prospects uh, as far as wealth management is concerned to uh, uh, not just to weather the storm of, of COVID, obviously, uh, but, but to stay relevant uh, in, the, in the long term because uh, a lot of these, you know, either B2C uh, fintechs or, or scale-ups, uh, startups or scale-ups, uh, or, or the big tech, actually, uh, are coming and... Uh, in some respects, risk eating the lunch of the banks uh, mm -hmm. if the banks don't, you know, take this seriously and, and invest seriously in, in technology. So, you know, back to the core of, uh, of the question, I think, you know, technology plays and will continue to play uh, a critical role in, in obviously how the banks and wealth managers can, can equip themselves uh, and, and really inject in, in the customer journey uh, that intelligence uh, that enables them to answer, you know, their customers' needs today, but also scale across segments. Another another point that that probably will make across the the conversation, but scaling across segments and and not just remaining into the high net worth segment, but going and expanding into you know mass affluent all the way down to retail uh, presents huge amounts of of opportunity and and value creation for for banks as as a business. So. At the end of the day, yes, that's that's really what uh, it will come down to. The ability to invest into into technology will probably make uh, a significant difference in in the business of of the incumbents and the banks, the wealth managers. Thanks, Julian. John, some additional viewpoint. Or oh, <laughs> from my colleagues there. I think uh, you know when we look we look at the figures, we look at. 30 trillion of AUM by 2025, as recent PwC report, you know, fastest growing region. There's a huge amount of opportunity, right, from what Mario says, from mass affluent, right, to what uh, Dominic says in terms of you know, ultra high net worth. And I think you have to have, um, obviously, an overarching digital strategy for to encompass all that and, and also be wary of the digital banks that are coming online. And uh, But you also need to have, you know, certain tactics to cater for each of those segments. And, and digital plays a part of that, whether you like it or not, in terms of providing you know, data sets, in terms of uh, having everything in the cloud. We're very cloud focused. We design 
uh, to be uh, you know, um, a solution to, to get rid of the paperwork that you mentioned, to make things streamlined, to, mm. to reduce time on admin so you could have time to talk to your clients, to, to have that data ready to pull off, whether you're on mobile, iPod, iPad, or, or, or you know, you've got your laptop out and wherever you are in, in Starbucks or wherever, you know, in the hotel lobby. So um, one of the other things that I didn't think was mentioned, one of the driving forces, I think, is compliance. Having um, you know, the digital solution allows you to very much make your uh, compliance a lot easier. Perfect audit trails, et cetera, who's ac accessed what, when, how, what's been, what products have been published, when it was published, et cetera, et cetera, who it's gone out to, hasn't gone out to the right people, uh, wrong people, sorry. And uh, in terms of that, also when it comes to onboarding, reminding people to, to accredit, having those digital tools, those basic elements, I think are, are, are very fundamental. And what we found with a lot of clients who, who started to work with and, and realized the, the importance of, of what we were trying to bring to the table in terms of digital solution, and we're very much front office, by the way, uh, they've, they've, they've sort of then looked at other projects that they could, that they could and across other departments, you know, be it investment banking, uh, coming into, into the more private space and allowing us to, to expand and, and the sort of tool set and digitize more of the company and you know, and slowly integrate integrate as well across across departments. So that that's been a driving force, that ability to to, to integrate now as well. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, let's just stay with you. And okay. uh, from for, <laughs> from the drivers, we go now to the challenges. What are the challenges from your point of view that Asia Pacific wealth management firms are facing in their technology strategy and why? Um, I like to see it uh, not just as challenges, but op opportunities. Uh, I think uh, that's as, the as next we... question. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, okay. it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> but um, some of the challenges are really, uh, you know, you've got that fine balance between, um, as, as mentioned, between sort of the, the use of technology, the role of technology, and, and the human human advice. And and I think uh, the challenge is really rather than technology is not going to replace. Uh, you know, human human advisory you know, at, at most levels. Obviously, at, lo at robo advisor level, the five k that was mentioned. Yes, okay, you get away with it. But other ultra high net worth, high net worth, ultra high net worth, especially when it comes to private deals, and private markets that we're involved in, then you know you're going to need that human advice. Uh, where where we do where the yeah, so that's that's the sort of understanding precisely how that technology is to be used uh, and the plethora of choice and the ability, the challenge of in integration into legacy systems i think is is um is a challenge for for most tech vendors uh and most it uh, directors and, and cios um we mentioned covid19 accelerating that pace of adopting technology um i think that you know obviously we you know we as technology vendors need, need to make the most of that um i think it's an education process what was inherently um done in-house a lot of banks, you know, thought they were big enough and, and good enough to develop solutions in-house. Uh, has you know that mindset is slowly eroding, thankfully, and and now uh, companies are more comfortable looking at at smaller, uh, nimble, agile uh, technology vendors uh, like ourselves. I mean, we push out updates every two weeks. Um, we're, we're super agile on on things like that, and you know, letting them focus on providing good quality products to their clients. And letting technology take care of that distribution, uh, take care of that CRM, take care of the, uh, the reporting and, uh, and providing the, the, the data sets that they can utilize, and let them focus on that part of the business as to as to you know, worrying about the unnecessary paperwork or, as I mentioned, compliance and, and aspects of, of the business. So I see some of those as the, as the key challenges to for, for banks to, to you know buy into that mindset. Um, there, obviously, there's a lot of talk around digitization. Again, that was mentioned, and when you get into into the institution, you do realize that you know that there is there's a lot of work to be done um, um, within within that. And um, you know, it's not so much um, us being uh, um, you know trying to just sell a simple solution, but it, it's I think the, the challenge is to be accepted as a partner, as a con as a consultant, as a consultancy to to go along with that journey uh, that they have. Uh, going forward yeah thanks john julian or dominic any add-ons yeah sure for me 
Uh, look, I think you know I can speak to two challenges that uh, that we observe and 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 that we read also in in some research paper. But on one hand, to you know to continue a little bit on on the uh, on the theme of customer experience that I was talking about earlier, uh, you know it's it's with regard to the fact that uh, high net worth individuals today are probably not satisfied with the touch points that they have. Uh, Related to uh, personalized updates or or recommendations, interacting with with experts, uh, there is something that's that's missing in uh, in how you know bankers interact with their with their customers, uh, and obviously in the context of of a pandemic, that's only exacerbated uh, as a uh, uh, as a sentiment. And so, what it means is that the current you know digital wealth experience is not meeting expectations of of today's investors. Uh, and and like you know, I touched on earlier, it's because uh, technology is ubiquitous in in their everyday life. Uh, they get everything and, and anything on demand uh, at the touch of their of their iPhone or or mm -hmm. Samsung, and it's uh, uh, and it's working and it needs to work because the same experience needs to be had, uh, you know, with their financial advisor, with their bankers, and so. Those are challenges that we're addressing, you know, with with some of our offerings, and in particular our, our digital collaboration offering, which really enables clients and and bankers alike uh, to collaborate uh, and and to exchange, uh, you know, content, to exchange ideas, to exchange recommendations uh, in in secure and compliant uh, channels, obviously, but also in a way that's a lot more personalized uh, and. And our capabilities in in AI, uh, which oftentimes sounds uh, sound like a buzzword, but are real uh, from the acquisition of of Incube that we completed in March this year, uh, a Zurich-based company that has uh, developed products in in AI and machine learning for the last ten years. Uh, so you know the capabilities that we have now to really personalize what clients are able to get uh, makes a huge difference in in how we speak to. In, in 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 the discussions we have with our customers and and it's a reality uh, because you've seen uh, you know DBS announced just last week or two weeks ago I forgot uh, that they have actually launched some uh, elements of hyper personalization in their i wealth platform uh, and so it exists uh, so you have banks like DBS which are the front front of innovation can invest and deliver uh, you have other other banks that that work on it uh, and that can benefit from you know. Uh, offerings like ours that accelerates really their their path towards making this uh, a reality. Uh, the other the other challenge, and I'll try to uh, keep it very short because uh, I want to be conscious of time uh, and and cover other other uh, questions that you've prepared. But uh, you know, as, as digitalization accelerates, the uh, the industry's uh, economics will will change also, uh, and I'm I'm referring here to to the disruptors. So. Uh, the startups, uh, the fintechs, uh, B2C, or, or the big apps, what I was mentioning earlier. And, and in Asia, because your question was, was really about Asia, uh, you, you see it a little bit everywhere, right? Uh, in the intermediation and, and exec-only space, uh, zero commission, uh, which obviously has been uh, pretty much uh, democratized in the US with Robinhood, is, is everywhere here in Singapore, with TD, TD Ameritrade, Philip Securities, uh, and you have other actors like SoFi or, or Revely that are that are coming into the fold uh, across Asia. Uh, in the credit field, you know the, the buy now, pay later uh, space, particularly in in Australia, uh, Mario, you you probably have heard. But uh, the two largest banks, the two incumbents, are forced or have been forced because they've announced, uh, you know, to uh, also offer zero percent uh, credit cards. And and that's really to stay relevant uh, and to keep. You know, being able to, to play in the same uh, in in the same market, uh, and so you know, we we see all these uh, elements of of the value chain uh, for the banks, for the wealth managers being attacked. I don't mention the robo advisors, uh, but they're obvious in in their own right. Or the super apps with Grab launching a, an auto invest offering and and Penang, you know, joint venturing with. Uh, uh, with Kebank, uh, if I'm not wrong, in in Thailand, so you've got you know the value chain which is being attacked at various parts of it, uh, and and technology is really the only uh, 
answer uh, to be able to remediate this for, for the banks. Uh, and the banks will need to leverage technology to rethink how they provide access, rethink how uh, the, the customers consume those services they provide access to. Uh, and on the back of it, obviously, we we think in many respects their, their business model, uh, the pricing model, how they create value, uh, not just for their shareholders, but for their stakeholders. Uh, so a, a lot is at stake, but a lot of it can originate uh, as a solution from, from technology. Perfect. Thanks, Julian. Dominic, something you want to add? I think in the interest of time, um, very, very quickly, I would echo what Julian said. I think the two challenges that we have in the industry are relationship managers and legal and compliance. And mm -hmm. how you can drive relationship managers further to push the top line and how you can harness the sprawling octopus that is legal and compliance inside of the institution to become, I, I dare say it, but become operationally more efficient is the key challenge. And that is, I think, clearly where technology has a role to play, you know, and, and one of, one of, one of the many technology challenges inside of these institutions, which has been mentioned before, is is just how complicated their tech stacks are for legacy reasons, for mergers and acquisition reasons, etc. And so how firms can start to adopt joined up technology that really does provide benefits is, I think, a, a mega challenge because um, I will probably talk about other things to do with this later, but... but um, it's difficult in the wealth management industry to get quick off the shelf wins. And the danger that I've seen inside of firms with, with the, the proliferation of FinTech over the last five to 10 years over here in Singapore is all of a sudden technology departments inside of the banks are dealing with tens of vendors. They have vendor management, they have API management to do. Uh, it, it's not just plug and play, as many people think. That that involves maintenance on the on the banking side, let alone compliance maintenance for for technology vendors and who they're actually dealing with. So, it's a very complicated landscape, and and you know our approach is one approach, and and that is to try and join things up into a seamless integration layer from front to back. Um, that of course comes with challenges that projects tend to be sizable but we're trying to enable banks to, to quickly plug bits of functionality in through the likes of APIs, but have one layer of, of client data and prospect data underpinning through CRM, which, which you know, we, we believe is, is the future. But whether you can get a bank to immediately buy into that for cost time reasons it is a challenge. That's, that's a key point. Absolutely. Thanks, Dominic. Now let's turn to opportunities and then talking to or listening to you three very, how can I say, experienced sales business people, obviously uh, the challenges, uh, how say, you, you see rather opportunities than challenges. So we, we touched on some of the challenge uh, on the opportunities while we were talking about the uh, challenges. But Julian, what can the wealth management industry deliver through its use of technology? I think, you know, the, uh, uh, well, I'll stick with the main theme of, of what we do, right? Digitalize wealth management at large uh, and, and try to go through uh, the evolution of it uh, because digitalized wealth management can be broken down into pieces, uh, digitalizing the, uh, the advisory content journey uh, and digitalizing the, the actual interaction, which is very much a uh, flavor of the month between between bankers and their clients, obviously, given the situation today. But, but sticking to just the first point of, of digitalizing the advisory content, uh, we need to look at, at the process, right? The first step is uh, to digitalize uh, the financial wealthness discussion that, that you can have with, with your customers, where you analyze the investment needs, the objectives, uh, where you figure out you know, the risk appetite suitability. Uh, once you've done that, you define a financial plan uh, and an investment strategy. And at that point of, which is the first, the third step of uh, implementation of, of that strategy that you've defined with suitable product, 
you can here uh, leverage uh, you know technologies in artificial intelligence and and cognitive uh, technologies to really inject uh, an element of uh, of personalization and intelligence that makes a big difference because these steps uh, from you know financial planning uh, to an investment strategy to implementing uh, implementing that that strategy and and monitoring uh, the portfolio it exists by and large uh, it exists it's maybe not implemented everywhere yet uh, and we we find this also maybe not uh, commoditized uh, but it exists by and large and so you know injecting this you know next best action uh, type of approach when it comes to implementing the, the defined strategy uh, leveraging data science and, and, and cognitive technology is is really making a difference and and so we use artificial intelligence really to mine uh, the client data uh, as well as the product uh, data and its its universe uh, but we do that uh, in order to predict client preferences or affinities to uh, to specific products or, or proposals uh, obviously in compliance uh, which has been mentioned before with uh, either regulatory constraints or, or with you know the client's profiles and uh, and uh, and preferences uh, but at the end of the day, if you know enough about your client and, and compare it with the aggregate, so kind of a you know synthetic uh, population, if you like, uh, that looks like your client in terms of demographics, in terms of you know geographical location, attitude to risk, uh, it's possible to predict the affinity of a client uh, to a group of products in the form of of a matrix or, or ratings, and you know we call this Netflixing of of advice. <laughs> Uh, but it, it really, at the end of the day, is a different, a different application for wealth management of a similar technology that is used uh, by Netflix, but it's used by, by Amazon uh, and others, obviously. Uh, and, and the benefit is that you maximize or you, you, you aim to maximize the conversion rate uh, while uh, minimizing the, the marketing cost or the time spent by your ICs and your your RMs uh, to recommend buy, sell, you know, switch uh, action. So, so that you know that really makes a difference. Of course, the other the other big benefit, uh, and I touched on it very briefly earlier, is that you can scale what is feasible today. You know, just for a small high net worth pool of clients, you can scale the same attention and individual <laughs> attention, personalized attention, uh, to achieve you know a reach to greater and larger client um, segments so obviously the mass affluent and and all the way down to you know to the retail client base i mean we've we've seen the announcement of stand chart and that they're not the only one that they're certainly not the last one uh, who have uh, announced that they are folding private banking into uh, the retail banking which i thought was uh, was very interesting it was not merging both it was uh, it was integrating private banking into retail banking which is uh, a choice of word that they they uh, they made on you know uh, carefully I'm sure uh, and so you know we've seen tremendous basically interest in uh, in this in this field uh, and and last but not least because it also touch on the ability to you know offer your clients not just uh, recommendations that are uh, relevant to them uh, but also because it can uh, root some uh, investment recommendations around ESG, for instance, which has been very popular, but instead of just pushing it uh, as, a, as a product blankly and, and without any further thoughts, you can really analyze and then again mine your client data to, to see which ones you know, will resonate better to a specific group of clients or not. And some of them, clients, do not need or do not care today about ESG, so why push it? Uh, so it, it's really been multi-dimensional uh, discussions that we've had uh, and, and exciting discussions. Uh, and, and we're seeing banks really putting money and resources at work to, uh, to make this a uh, reality. So I'll stop here, sorry. Thanks a lot, Julian. Uh, Dominic, obviously execution pays bonus, right? All the plans and talking, if there is no execution, wouldn't result in any anything, right? What is, from your point of view, the roadmap that firms, the firms are taking in terms of their technology focus and future development, and where are they on that journey? I think the um, the roadmap varies quite considerably, Mario, depending on 
the type of institution, not necessarily the size and depending on the geography. Um, and, and when we go into to banks in particular across the region, it's quite staggering how advanced or, or not advanced they are on that roadmap. And I think look, technology's its voice inside of the institutions is getting louder and louder as years go by. Um, technology spend uh, is, is going up globally inside of banks by six, seven percent a year. It's accelerating at the fastest rate it's accelerated for a long time. So the, the, the willingness is there. I think where we are at this juncture is that, and certainly we're seeing this, is, is back to this um, this two sides of the coin, if you like. So there's a lot of discussion, and especially in the media, a lot of talk around digital transformation. The reality that we're seeing through COVID is that the banks are under some severe cost pressure. Uh, you just look at the, the top three banks in Singapore, uh, the local banks, and their share prices are down 25% pretty much across the board, all three, year to date. And you know, we're, we're, we are in this market and we can see that that is having an impact on how their aspirations for the technology roadmap um, is, is being affected, it's being pushed out. So what's coming in its place because they're not standing still and they cannot stand still. What we're seeing is that the really large projects at the moment are not being shelved but are being pushed into 2021, possibly beyond. And in its place, they are hot fixing issues. Um, or, or if they're not issues, they are applying some quick solutions to some quite specific problems. Um, and if we move away from cost driven problems like, like compliance, the solutions that we're seeing them apply are very driven towards sales revenue at this juncture right now. Um, and you know, many conversations that we're in to do with larger client lifecycle management rollouts and prospecting and onboarding and then the relationship manager tool those those three bits of the jigsaw all together are being focused much more on perhaps winning clients prospecting are being focused on how they can more make more out of the client book that they already have so quick and simple sales tools that can layer on top and I, and I think here it is exactly the issue that the, the industry has. It's that it, in our experience where those solutions patches are really very simple, they're very, very temporary. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid saying it's a waste of money because one would hope that it has a very quick ROI, but it's not a long-term ROI. And, and the argument or the, or the the proposition still stands, which is very much the proposition that we hang our hat on, which is that you have to get your data foundation correct. You have to invest in a CRM. And by the way, CRM, you know, is one of those acronyms that has moved on a tremendous amount over the last five years. It's no longer a screen with just a list of fields. It's more accessible for a relationship manager. But you have to get that CRM foundation right, which is when we have evolved our business from CRM up into CRM. But without that, it becomes very difficult to adopt meaningful modules on top of the foundation. What you're, 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 you're left with plugging in top heavy temporary roofs on top of foundations that are not sturdy. And I think fortunately, we've seen quite a lot of activity recently with CLM style RFPs Fortunately, it does seem to be getting through. And for those firms who do have the budget, they are still investing in getting that CRM underpinning correct. Because once you have that correct, then the ability to add module by module, the ability to do all the great stuff that Julian's talking about around next best suggestions, which I think personalization is the key opportunity or necessity of our industry going forward. To adopt those great tools, you do have to have a very solid underpinning, um, and you know that involves not only getting the CRM right, but involves integration, which which everybody, no one in the in the institutional side relishes because of course that comes with delivery cost, and I dare say it, the vendors often don't like it either because it comes with massive risk and, and time uh, and cost. 
but uh, integration is required. And you know, a lot of the slogans going around at the moment saying, oh, we just want some very low, low integration, zero integration tools. Sounds fantastic, but the reality is to really get meaningful output on things like tailored recommendations, on things like sentiment analysis, there does need to be a level of integration. And it goes back to the original point, an investment in the right foundations is critical. Uh, and that, that comes with cost, that comes with a solid strategic roadmap, not just a roadmap for a year or two. I think that, uh, I'll, if I can just speak on, on, sure, on this, sure. I mean, pick on this, build on this, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it really, it, it's true. I mean, having a strong foundation is, is, is critical. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're seeing, and, and we're seeing what Dominicus just mentioned, you know, uh, banks and, and, and wealth managers that want uh, a as light integration solution as possible. And so, you know, when, when we uh, conceptualize and when we built uh, and launched our, our next best action, which was we just relaunched or launched recently, uh, is it was meant to be, and it is uh, a point solution. And, and that's really to answer, you know, the need of, of these banks uh, for low integration or, or light integration types of, of solution. We're, we're fortunate, or I'm fortunate, I guess, in my role to, uh, to be with a firm that has built over 20 years, a very microservices and, and modular componentized offering. Uh, and so we have already that ability that doesn't take away the need for integration, but that ability to offer clients to uh, start small and, and build uh, around what they started with uh, as far as our offering is concerned. But beyond this, uh, we did realize some time ago, and I think today it's, it's front and center, that point solutions are, are very important. Uh, still has to be integrated somewhat, but uh, our next best action, for example, uh, can run uh, on itself as long, obviously, as it gets the data that it requires to understand clients' uh, uh, clients' historical uh, behaviors and, and transactions, and, and as an ability on the basis of that data to cluster and 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 create uh, synthetic population to uh, to recommend the best possible you know outcomes switched or, or, or products. So I think the the roadmap today is obviously with large budgetary constraints, uh, looking at what can be implemented that will make a difference, obviously at, at the less integration cost possible. Uh, and at the same time, what is it that I must, regardless of, of costs almost, uh, invest into? Uh, and, and that's, again, in relation also to the disruptors that are coming and really attacking the value chain uh, from a lot of different angles and and actually pretty much successfully at that uh, not everybody has been successful not every neo bank uh, has been successful some have already folded uh, in Europe for instance and and we'll see what it comes uh, to the to the neo banks here in uh, uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore uh, but those disruptors are putting a lot of pressure and the banks need to uh, to answer uh, to these pressures and and so in our, in, our, um, in our case, it's really a function of uh, providing the solutions that are as light as possible in terms of, of delivery, in terms of integration, uh, but I, that answer as much as possible the need of today. I won't talk about, again, about you know, digital collaboration, but this, is, this has been key, uh, a key part of the, of the conversations we've, we've had. Th thanks a lot, Julian. And in order for me, because we have a hard stop at seven o'clock and in order to deliver up to my promise, um, surprisingly, we got a lot of questions in, in our chat box. Thank you for that. Obviously, you are a very engaged and curious audience. Uh, we really appreciate that. So let me pick up some of the question. And there's actually one question that kind of almost sums up the, the few more questions that I have prepared. So mm. thank you for whoever has uh, sent this one through. And the one I would like to uh, address to the panel is the question on how do you see the balance between human and machine interactions evolving in the future? Do Asian clients want more or less machine interaction? Mm. Who of you has a view oh, on that? 
I think it depends where you are on a scale in, in your private wealth journey as an individual. If you're in a mass affluence, I think it's, it's readily acceptable. You're a younger generation, you're millennials. You, you respect AI, you understand machine learning to a certain degree. You'll adopt robo-advisors and, and you'll have a, a serious risk, risk appetite associated with that. I think uh, it's complementary as you move further up the scale. Um, that's what we found at Delio. Obviously, we're, we're, we're touching high net worths, ultra high net worths. Uh, and our technology is an enabler. It's complementary. It, uh, clients can leave it or take it. They, they know it's there, whether it's a multifamily office and they have someone running it for them. Um, internal advisors, they, they, they use it because it speeds up their transaction process. They also have that repository of data. Uh, and we're able to analyze that data for them and provide that insight and information as they grow their businesses so they can do more with less. And we've found that in a number of case studies with our clients. So it's, it's definitely not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to be aware of your target audience uh, and basically be customer obsessed in that, in that sense and understand exactly their requirements and scale to that. Perfect. Thanks, yeah, John. I think the point on client segment is an important one when it comes to the balance between human and, and digital, right? Uh, in the question. And, and so, you know, we didn't talk about hybrid advisory, but hybrid advisory in many respects enables, uh, you know, that, that balance to be, to be had between a self-service journey for, you know, lower value, let's say, type of activities that a client can take on on its, on its own versus the more intimate or, or human involved types of, uh, of interactions that require obviously an advisor, right? And, and so clients generally, when, when they are you know, uh, hybrid customers, let's say, uh, if it's about seeking information, uh, there's no problem, they'll do it. If it's about transacting, they'll do it self-service. But when it's about uh, looking for advice, uh, that human, uh, element is is really important and so you know the question really uh, in many respects is you know today you can't you can't bring your customers to to a restaurant you cannot go to a sporting event you can go to a client event so banks need to reimagine really how to still interact meaningfully uh, but digitally with their clients and and in a way keep the the white glove service uh, through a screen and and continue to foster that trust. So, uh, injecting really, uh, you know, those those human interventions digitally uh, is is what I think uh, is in large part of the, of the answer. But it's it's very much applicable to to high net worth individuals. Uh, the ability to leverage that technology across segments give you a chance to scale basically. But I think. You know, it doesn't take away if you move across segments the necessity to have, at some point, uh, a human intervention. Well, I, I think, just to add on to that, I think it's been staggering for me, at least, and I was a private banker, that the role that I see now of a private banker and a premier banker uh, and the tools that they're using hasn't really fundamentally changed over the last 20 or so years. And, and back to my point early on, when you consider that so much of the revenue in mass affluent high net worth and ultra high net worth is still driven by the relationship manager, yes, there's digital touch points that are, that are being evolved. That, 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 that relationship manager has been massively underinvested in with technology tools. And I, and I think you know, it's another positive, if you like, from this negative COVID environment that we've got finally a bit more of a microscope on how we can, we, the banks, can empower their relationship manager, their sales teams, uh, their client management teams to have better tools to provide better relationships and ultimately, of course, provide more revenue. Thanks a lot, Dominic. Uh, as the countdown is happening, um, we have a, a minute or so. Um, thank you very much to the panel. I really appreciate and I think we could go on for another hour. Also, thank you very much for the engaged audience. I mean, you don't see yourself how you're engaged. I just see the number of questions coming, coming in. And what I can promise you, we will find a way to answer all the questions that you have raised and communicate back to you because they are really good questions. And actually, we could have run the panel on the back of these questions. Uh, thank you very much for, 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 for engaging with us. So uh, we hope that uh, all of you found at least some 
interesting insight that you didn't know before and it hopefully created some value add for you going back to work tomorrow and uh, we look forward to welcoming you to more wealth tech talks in the near future thank you very much and thanks again to the panel and uh, have a good day good afternoon and good evening you. wherever you are thank you very much thank you bye, bye. take care